All right, everyone, we have a very interesting talk today where we're going to be discussing scientism, materialism, and physicalism as an irrational faith. And appropriately enough, we have philosopher of the mind, Peter Schustet H. here with us today. He is a fantastic philosopher, and um, I'm really happy to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be here, Morg. Thanks for uh, making this happen. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have to say that um, I've read your books, Neo Nihilism and Pneumonautics. They are absolutely fantastic. Um, some you. of my favorites. And uh, I hear that you have an upcoming TED Talk, but there's some concern it might be banned. Um, well, yeah, no, it was recorded in November, you know, um, and um, it's it's the only talk not to have gone up from that session. So it could be a technical issue, uh, but it also, you know, there's a small possibility it will be banned. And I'm only thinking that because um, there are other TED Talks about psychedelics out there. This My one's called Understanding Consciousness Through Psychedelics. But um, my talk's sort of talking about the uh, intellectual worth of psychedelic experience, not just the medicinal value. And uh, as a result, I don't know, it could be seen as a um, little, little too uh, on the edge for Ted, but we'll see. I, I hopefully, it will be up um, within a few days. But um, well, I, I could see why you're concerned. That's certainly out there for what is generally on um, on TED Talks. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And um, so just for um, those who may not be familiar, do uh, you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? <clears throat> sure. Um, I was born in Sweden, uh, but I have a British father. I was brought up in Britain for the most, in the southwest of Britain, called, a place called Cornwall. Um, I am a philosopher of mind, uh, also a metaphysician, but I focus mostly on the mind, so consciousness, the logic about consciousness, how it relates to reality generally. Um, I, um, I was a college teacher in London for six years before I started my PhD three years ago, and uh, only last week I passed it. So I'm now sort of a proper philosopher, almost, you know. If, oh, congratulations. That's a cool question, what makes a philosopher, you know, but I've got a PhD now, so there's that at least. That's fantastic. Now, so you mentioned being a philosopher of the mind, and I know that you have some... Um, you know, you mentioned uh, giving a talk on psychedelics and things like that. So have you noticed, uh, have you had resistant resistance from, say, you know, some more established, the establishment, these sorts of ideas? Um, not ostensibly, but, for example, to get funding to, to, to do, a let's say, say, a doctorate on psychedelics and consciousness is more difficult than standard topics because, for a number of reasons, um, I don't think it's so much that people are opposed to it, it's just that there is not much literature on it and so not many people who can uh, supervise it. Um, so as a result, it's a kind of self-perpetuating circle of, um, of absence. Um, so it, at least here in Britain, people are you know, quite open to it. I think this has changed in the last five to ten years, you know, before it was a definite faux pas, any illegal drugs. But now, I, th I think what's happened is the medicinal use of psychedelics have um, come into... The mainstream media and you know no one can be opposed to healing right so as right. a result people have opened up their mind to the to the sort of potentials of psychedelics uh, the intellectual value though is still um something to be uh, accepted but nonetheless i haven't really had much opposition to it only only interest the only thing i'd say is you know when i speak to certain uh, professors of philosophy at uh, university they they always express a lot of interest in these things but they that but they then secretly said you know when i was a uh, you know, 10 years ago, I took some magic mushrooms, but they would never publicly say it because there's still that danger, you know, that uh, you could lose your tenure or whatever. So mm -hmm. so there's that. But I think it's swiftly changing now, swiftly changing. Yeah, and that, that's that's great to hear. And you mentioned there there's not much literature on the subject. Uh, that's actually how I came across your work because I was desperately looking for some examination of the psychedelic experience that had some philosophical rigor to it. Right. <laughs> uh, ra rather than just you know um, like uh, hippie trip reports or something. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean that's that's sort of what I found. So that you know, pre nineteen sixties, there was some interesting sort of a philosophic or academic literature on it, like William James especially, and that's how I got into it actually through William James. Um, but that was a hundred years ago, and um, Aldous Huxley to a certain extent, but he's not really a philosopher; he's more of a sort of writer with philosophical themes. 
Um, so, uh, so I, I mean, when I when I first took my uh, when I first took psychedelics, uh, relatively late in life, you know, um, late twenties, I uh, yeah, I was shocked to find this really relatively speaking little literature. Um, over time, I've discovered a bit more, but still, or, you know, compared to other themes in philosophy like mental causation or or whatever it may be, epistemology, it's, it's really minimal. So I thought I'd have a stab at starting off the discussion. And that was my book, The Numenautics, in, uh, what, 2015, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just the tip of the iceberg, it's just the beginning of it all, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's starting now. And, yeah, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I think it's an absolute travesty that there's this philosophical gold mine, uh, mm. as, you know, as it were, that, that it's generally completely ignored. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd add one more thing, one more interesting historical uh, point to that, which is that when... Um, in the first psychedelic wave, or actually people call it the second wave, but in the 1960s, um, when psychedelics became, you know, a big thing, philosophy of mind was very reductivist, you know, very materialist. So um, people even doubted whether consciousness existed. Uh, you know, you had behaviorism and, and so on, psychoident psychoneural identity theory. So um, unfortunately, that, that coincided with then psychedelic bloom. So there was no real philosophical interest in the consciousness of psychedelics because of bad timing, basically. But now, when we've sort of moved past, generally speaking, a lot of that reductionism, um, I think there's, again, there's then a lot more potential to study it in more detail, with a, with a more open mind, more interesting theories, different frameworks. Absolutely. And, and so on that note, um, I find it really interesting, you know, since we're going to be talking here about materialism and, and physicalism, that uh, people really seem to be brought up in a certain time frame, and they just adopt the paradigm of yeah. the time that they're born in. Whether they're born in the, you know, early ages of humanity, they thought their creation myths were true. In the Christian era, they thought that, you know, the stories about a bearded guy watching them masturbate it was true. And they think, you know, now being born in the materialist era, mm. they just take these ideas for granted that they're true. When a hundred years from now, people are going to look back at scientism now and see that it's really a childish and primitive view of reality. Mm. Um, that's why I really stress that people think for themselves and don't get caught up in the time that they were born in, so that they can really step out of that time and place. Um, I think that's why Nietzsche. That's why Nietzsche is so valuable. Nietzsche of all philosophers, because he really pulls you out of your time and place and gives you an objective overview. I think. I, Nietzsche, Nietzsche I, more I than. Love, uh, Nietzsche is one of my favorite philosophers, and um, I actually grew up in a very strict Christian household. No, oh, really. And um, my exposure <laughs> to his work is what was able to pull me out of that dogmatic way of thinking. Um, oh, really? Yeah, the, uh, the Antichrist. What, what kind of Christian uh, family was it? Evangelical or? Just fundamentalist. Fundamentalist, yeah. Oh, yeah, just, just fundamentalist. So yeah, very strict. I was, I was homeschooled, isolated, um, you know, could only watch pre-approved, you know, VHS tapes that had been edited beforehand. Um, I wasn't taught evolution or, any, or anything like this. So wow. yeah, really um, not, not not great at all. So I, I, I started up in this, this Christian household, then my exposure to uh, Nietzschean philosophy and the likes of Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens um, pulled me out of that. Yeah. And, and I started having more materialist, agnostic uh, leanings. Mm -hmm. And my exposure to psychedelics kind of brought me to a Cartesian dualism. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I moved into a rational idealism. <laughs> You're sort of through the high Hegelian uh, flow of logic. It sounds like your life is phenomenology. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, I also, uh, yeah, absolutely. It also sort of mirrors the Jungian uh, functions of emotion, right. sensory, intuitive, and uh, thinking. And the hero's um, journey, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. I'm Christopher Hitchens once in London, actually, yeah. just in a hotel bar where I, um, I spoke to him about his book, God is Not Great. It just came out then. And uh, oh, there's a typo in it, but he wouldn't accept that. And then we had oh. like one conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, that wasn't up for it. He's dead. Mm. Um, so, uh, uh, spe so speaking about um, materialism, I obviously reject the idea of materialism and physicalism. And um, I'm assuming that that's also your position. Yeah, but um, <laughs> it, it sort of. 
So, I, funnily enough, last week then I had my visa, my examination, PhD examination, with um, Galen Strawson, who's a quite well-known philosopher, very well-known philosopher, and he's a panpsychist, which means that he believes that basic forms of mentality exist in all of reality. Mm -hmm. And um, we were actually discussing uh, the definition of physicalism or materialism. So, in my PhD, generally speaking, I say, you know, I'm, I'm, I see physicalism, as you do, as a sort of religion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and a faith position. In fact, it's explicitly a faith position in certain philosophers. I'll, I'll speak about it in a moment. But, but he was saying that this view that, you see, I said one of the fundamental aspects of physicalism is a principle called no fundamental mentality. This is something that, for example, David Papineau, Wilson uh, speak about, that uh, whatever the physical is, it ha we have to accept it has no mentality. However, Galen Strawson was saying this is a post-1960s definition of physicalism, and before that, uh, it could have included uh, f the, f the physical, the material could have included mind, uh, and I disagreed about that. So I'll mm -hmm. put that qualifier out there. So there are, in other words, there are definitions of physicalism which I might accept, but I think it's pushing its uh, extensional pruning. It's pushing the definition a little bit too far. Yeah, I, I agree that that to me that would seem like it would not be physicalism at all, but. Yeah. Um, I know, um, but uh, Karl Popper also sort of actually does um, classify panpsychism as a physicalism, but uh, then uh, in the same sort of chapter in his book, he says, uh, but it's sort of quasi-physicalism. But anyway, I think we, you and I probably agree with, the, generally speaking, what we mean by physicalism. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, and, uh, <coughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I do see it as a faith position. I mean, I was looking in the doctorate at um, psychoneural identity theory, which is that uh, mentality simply is the brain. So it's a complete reduction to the brain. Um, and uh, one of the key proponents of that was JJC Smart, who wrote a, I say called materialism. And uh, he writes that he, he explicitly is, uh, cannot believe that um, reality is anything other than material. And he even calls it a faith. But he says it would be a crazy if it were not true. But it's, I mean, when you get to the fundamentals of materialism, and, when you touch materialism fundamentally, you always it always incorporates mind. Um, you do get to certain faith positions, yeah. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you trace the the history of physical, I use physical physicalism and, and materialism synonymously. By the way, some people differentiate them, but mm -hmm. I think that it's better to use them the same way. I if you trace the history of it, though. Um, you see, you can understand why. Uh, it became a religion in a way, uh, because, I mean, start, I think it really starts, I mean, you get the sort of materialists in ancient Greece, but in the modern world, it starts with um, Galileo, who separated the material world, as in something which is extensive, you know, spatial, solid, uh, and so on, uh, passive, with um, what later were called secondary qualities, like color, sound, and whatever. Uh, Descartes sort of um, solidified that, Hobbes, other, other people. And then we get this, as a result, and of course these were founders of um, science, as a result we get this notion that uh, fundamental reality is, has these non-mental properties, and then the problem is, well, how do we then explain colour, sound, and all qualia, experience, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And then we get, you know, what is recently called the hard problem of consciousness, uh, or uh, generally the mind matter problem, which is how the hell do mind and matter relate? You know, we know they correlate, but 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 cor correlation presents the problem; it doesn't answer it. That's why I always laugh when I go. On. You always get these uh, articles every month from uh, you know journalists who say philosophers have spent thousands of years trying to discover, you know, so try to solve the mind matter problem, but this new scientist now has shown that there's a correlation between X and Y, right? But oh. Everyone accepts a correlation. That's that's. It's never you. You never to provide an exp, a correlation is not to provide an explanation. You know the interesting question is well, why is there a correlation? Is it a matter of cause? Is it a relation of identity? Is it a relation of common cause? And and both mind and matter are effects. You know, so the same correlation can indicate various different theories. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I, it's, I, it's I don't think that people uh, understand the question. I, I don't think they really realize that the hard problem of consciousness is even a problem at all. I, I think there's no. a disconnect. 
No, and uh, I mean, a lot of people think that consciousness is um, the remit of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's presuming that consciousness is, is uh, limited to the brain, human, especially the human brain. You know, if, I mean, like I, as you probably know, I'm sort of a panpsychist. So I think that fundamental, like Galen Strawson, like, like a lot of like Leibniz, Spinoza, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, I think in his later work, is my interpretation, um, you know, the view that forms of mind are fundamental throughout nature. So mm -hmm. therefore, consciousness, or mind at least, is not the remit of neuroscience. That's simply the human consciousness. People yeah, absolutely. Really and, and myself being an idealist, uh, we completely agree there. Um, you know, I think that mind is ubiquitous. So right. um, having uh, the brain give rise to mind, you know, dead, lifeless matter giving rise to subjectivity. Mm. You know, the experience of the color red or something like this is just, you know, absolutely crazy that people think that this is possible. Yeah, I mean, you know, William James, for example, said, um, <clears throat> you know, the idea that there was just insentient dead matter and then one at one point in history, pang, there was subjectivity or consciousness. However, simple, yeah? It doesn't matter if it's the slightest desire or aversion. Right. Uh, it's a radical jump in evolution. And it's if you believe that you need to show the evidence, and no one, no one has, and no one can. So you can't go back. No, and no go th this is this is like saying God. Oh, God, God did it. it yeah, it's exactly. It's I mean, it's, this is why exactly why I call it the big pang problem, as in pang of consciousness, because it's uh, it's, it's that second miracle. You know, people say, "Give <laughs> me one miracle, I'll give you the rest." The big bang, bang. <laughs> the big pang is is equally uh, mysterious. You know. That's I, li I like that the big pang. Yeah. That's that's you know, I, I like that, and it, it, it's it's true. It, and it, they they have this sort of cognitive dissonance where they you know think that um, religious miracles are crazy, mm -hmm. but then they throw in something that's equivalent. It's it's a miracle. They're yeah. Giving no no mechanism, no no reason, nothing. It just emerges. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, it's not a scientific. I mean, there's this position then called emergentism, which uh, this philosopher of mine, Jay Won Kim, says been the prevalent position since the 1970s that the, the mind emerges from the brain. Uh, the problem is um, the emergence of such requires, if it's, if you to say it's a scientific thesis, it requires um, what, known as tran what is known as transordinal nomology or bridge laws between the brain and the mind. But these are not laws of physics. These are not laws of science. So it's uh, pretentious to say it's a scientific theory. It's not. The only reason it's, it sort of pretends to be is because it's fundamentally physicalist, you know. So there's still, there's the fundamental laws of physics on the, on the bottom level, as it were, on the physical level. And then somehow, mind, at a certain level of complexity, mind that, that then emerges. But um, this is, uh, you can't even observe this. You, again, you can only observe correlation. And you can't really observe correlation because you can't observe the mind directly. You can observe reports and then create correlations. So it's highly problematic. Another massive problem for it is mental causation in terms of evolution as well, which is this, that if, if you reduce everything to the known laws of physics, um, then you're sort of ruling out mental causation, that the mind can have any effect upon reality. But if the mind has no effect at all, no power whatsoever, and I differentiate mental causation from free will, something somewhat distinct. But if the mind, generally speaking, has no power whatsoever, um, then what, like, as F.H. Bradley, the idealist, the British idealist, said in the, over 100 years ago, and Karl Popper said, then why did it evolve at all if it has no purpose? I mean, okay, there are vestigial organs, but they once did have a purpose. And there are spandrels in evolution, you know, things that evolve without any purpose. But to think that consciousness humans, but also in plausibly many other species. I mean, most biologists don't think about the mind. They think, yeah, obviously consciousness has had effect on our evolution. You know, our intelligence has enabled us to create tools and uh, build buildings and just work things out generally, you know, plan things. You know, this is a function of consciousness. That's why, that's why um, it evolved, you know, to serve as well. And that's why humans are superior to other organisms in that sense of power, because it's served as well. But if it's served as if consciousness, forms of consciousness such as intelligence, have served as well, it means they do have a power. But if they have a power, that power cannot be a law of nature as it's currently known. So therefore we know that the present paradigm of science, you know, it's possible that it will, it, well, it always does develop, that at the moment, the present paradigm of science cannot explain the mind at all. Yeah, a absolutely. And, you know, so uh, on the topic of speaking of the present paradigm, 
I wonder if you could talk a bit about uh, Hempel's dilemma. Okay, yeah. So um, another reason, well, one reason why uh, anyone who thinks for five minutes about it should become at least what <laughs> Strawson calls an agnostic materialist, at the very least, is this, Hempel's dilemma. So Hempel, Karl Hempel was a philosopher, lived in the 20th century. Um, it was actually devised by Herbert Fiegel before him, like 10 years before him, but for some reason Hempel got the credit. Right? And it's this. If you say you're a physicalist, um, you can go one of two ways. You can say on the one horn of the dilemma, you can say, I'm a physicalist and that means that I believe in the present phenomena of physics today, current physics. This is known as currentism. So this horn is currentism. So uh, by physical, I mean what we understand today, you know, in terms of space-time relativity, uh, quantum physics, um, mass, spin, charge, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem with that, though, is that we know that that can't, can't be true because current physics, you know, as everyone knows, is at a loggerheads. You know, theory of relativity and quantum theory, quantum mechanics, simply don't cohere. This is the big problem. So we know, all scientists, all physicists will accept there'll be a greater theory to encompass both in the future. And, and they're looking for that. And they call it a theory of, well, as part of the theory of everything, which uh, certain scientists gave up, like Stephen Hawking gave up on that towards, towards the end. But um, at the very least, we know that by, if we think that fundamental reality is physical, by which we mean current physics, we know we can't be right, can't be sufficiently right. Okay, so then what's the other horn? What's the other option? Well, it's um, futurism as opposed to currentism. Futurism is the view that, well, okay, current, I'm a physicalist and I believe not in current physics, um, but in a future physics, a, a completed ideal physics, which will have worked everything out and got all the laws of nature. The problem with that is, you know, it's a belief, it's a hope rather than a belief. You don't know what those laws will be. I mean, for all we know, um, science, physics might radically change as it has in the past. In fact, one reason uh, for not believing in currentism is known as pessimistic induction. If you look at the history of science and the history of physicalism, we see that it constantly changes. You know, you have progress and you have uh, paradigm shifts, as Kuhn calls them. Um, and it would be, historically speaking, it would be absurd to think that we've now reached the, you know, the point of completion. Obviously not. Um, so by pessimistic, pessimistic induction, you can rule that out. Um, but that also uh, sort of uh, applies to the futurist horn, which is that, um, yeah, we don't have any idea how physics might change. And for all we know, it could change to include mentali mentality within its fundamental um, phenomena, which means that it wouldn't be physicalism according to physicalism as we understand it today, generally speaking, with a no fundamental mentality principle. So, so you can't accept that either. That futurism, Karl Popper called futurism promissory materialism. It's like it's the promise that materialism will explain the mind in the future and will explain everything, you know. But it's just a promise, a hope, and that's why it's a faith. It's a faith. Yeah. It's a hope, you know, faith, hope, and charity, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. you either you either have to believe in something that you know is incorrect due to the incommensurability of relativity and quantum mechanics, yeah. or you have to believe in something that's not defined right now. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah, it's faith. It's faith. It's faith. You can't say it exactly. So. So where does that leave you? So um, at the very least, it leaves you at the agnostic, agnostic point, which is like, well, physicalism might be true, uh, but we don't know if it is, you know, at the very least. Um, but if you take it a step further, then you get into sort of a panpsychism or idealism or, or, or whatever. Dualism, I don't accept either, personally. Um, I mean, oh. I was... You can define idealism in different ways as well. Like Schopenhauer was an idealist, but also a panpsychist. You know, Karl Popper said Schopenhauer was a Kantian who turned panpsychist, so... I've got sympathies for that. I mean, the real, the real truth is nobody really knows what the answer is, but we can at least rule out, you know, through via negativa, we can rule out what can't be right. And, and I, I'm, 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 is there a reason why that uh, you subscribe to panpsychism over idealism? I mean, like I say, it's loose terms here because some people uh, classify panpsychism as, as idealism. But pan, generally speaking, I would say that, you know, instead of... I do believe in matter, unlike idealists, but I think that our idea of matter is a huge abstraction, by which I mean we only understand uh, a fraction of what it really is. Mm. A concept of matter is deficient. 
and our perception of matter is also deficient. We only see a small you know, fraction of the spectrum of light, for example, um, and uh, we can't perceive gravity waves directly and so on and so forth, and radiation. So, so um, I think, you know, it's very generally speaking here, and it's a linguistic issue, but I, I sort of do believe in matter, but I don't believe it is what we, be we think it is today. You know, for reasons of um, sort of uh, academic mistakes, um, what Whitehead calls fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We take an abstraction for reality, reification, and also because of the way humans have evolved. We have not evolved to see reality as it actually is uh, for practical purposes. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of very akin to um, idealism. It, but, it, is, it is. It seems almost more like a semantic issue, if anything. Um, yes. I yeah. think often it is. I mean, there's a great book called um, The Vindication of Absolute Idealism by Timothy Sprigg. Oh. And uh, that really is panpsychism, but he calls it idealism. Oh, I see. So, you know, it's, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's really interesting. Um, and and w one thing that I found interesting, I wanted to um, read a couple quotes by Max Planck, which um, I, I, I see, this is what I find extremely, so, you know, Planck is a, a founder of quantum mechanics. And he says, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms this much. There is no matter as such. Mm. And um, Heisenberg said that I think that modern physics has definitely decided in favor of Plato. In fact, the smallest units of matter are not physical objects in the ordinary sense. They are forms, ideas, which can be expressed unambiguously only in mathematical language. So mm. I think it's, it's, it's very interesting that we have these founders of quantum mm. mechanics that are uh, essentially denying the classical definition of matter, mm. and yet we still have these people that adhere to it. And, and another quote by Planck is that a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. So, yeah. I mean, Planck right there is essentially accusing the scientific community of being brainwashed. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the greatest scientists are always also metaphysicians. I mean, mm -hmm. I use quantum theorists, but you could also in, include Einstein. I mean, he was Absolutely. he said he was a Spinozan. Now, some mm -hmm. some people uh, classify Spinoza as an idealist, others as a uh, panpsychist, but again, it's a linguistic issue. But he wasn't a materialist. You know, well, some people accuse him of being a materialist, but he's, he's pretty oh, pretty clear that he's not a materialist. And Einstein was a, an ardent supporter of Spinoza and Schopenhauer in terms of free will. Um, he was best friends in Princeton with Kurt Gödel, you know, the incompleteness theorems. And Gödel was a, was a panpsychist who was a Leibnizian um, mm. variety of, and, and they were discussing uh, these things apparently every day, walking together, they were best buddies there in Princeton, uh, discussing a lot about Kant as well. So um, Einstein gained a big respect for the idealist Kant later in life. So yeah, I mean, um, you at these high, at least when you really think about these uh, things at the highest level, the scientists and the philosophers become one. I mean, philosophy always included. I mean, science today is what we classically call natural philosophy, um, and uh, but then it sort of specialised from the sort of late eighteen hundreds into something separate from philosophy. But really, it's a, it's it's just part of it. And the good thing I think. I mean, I'm sure this won't happen, but if we were to call scientists natural philosophers again, is it, they would be more tempted to take a step back and see how their particular theory then um, fits into the overall theories of, of metaphysics. But, um, yeah, the problem is people become too specialised. When you become specialised, you think that your little area sort of um, ex can explain everything, you know, and um, you don't get a bigger picture. But that's why, like I said, the most thoughtful of and the most famous of uh, scientists which generally were uh, not you know, straight up materialists. They were more open to the power of the mind within the whole of reality rather than just a, a sort of accidental and emergent property. And I think it would be very helpful if those who adhere to scientism would uh, actually study the metaphysical positions of these thinkers, but they have this shut up and calculate attitude. Yeah. They, they, almost seem, they almost seem proud to reject philosophy. Yeah, strange really, but um, that's what makes them secondary thinkers really <laughs> i mean like exactly. i said look at the history um yeah but yeah i i, I agree completely most, most, I think of, them, most I, of them assume they understand that 
the mind is simply the brain somehow. But when you get into the details, they well generate it generates the mind or it produces the mind. But these words, this word generate or produce. I mean, this is the big fundamental question. You know, you can't just say that. You know, it's nothing you can actually physically trace. You can't follow it. So um, yeah. But having said that, I mean, a lot of physicists are not materialists today. I mean, think about string theory and, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of physicists who believe in, you know, multiple dimensions or whatever. I mean, it'd be hard, that'd be a hard place to say they're physicalists, you know. I find that most physicalists today are actually more biologists who take a more sort of um, Victorian view of, uh, of physics than contemporary physics. Um, what I... I, I um... It seems to me, uh, I don't know if you, you've, you've had the misfortune of trying to argue with a religious fundamentalist, but they, they, they're so close-minded, and they only will take evidence from the paradigm that they're working from. So if you're trying to convince, like, say, a Christian, they're only going to believe you if you give them evidence from the Bible. Mm. And I noticed that when talking with materialists, they're still operating within their paradigm. So mm. they will only take evidence from within the paradigm they're already in. So they're constantly asking for empirical evidence. Yeah. When you're trying to give them a panpsychist or an idealist theory that has to do with the mind, they're essentially asking for empirical evidence of the mind. Which I is, mean, yeah, I have come across that. And what I say to them is that's like asking for empirical evidence for mathematical theories or theorems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you're, you're using the wrong tool for the job. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, this is a priori reasoning. It's sort of inference to the best explanation. It's a fit. Often metaphysics is there's a theory, um, <clears throat> which is our oh, hypothesis, by the word, which is put forward, which then a lot over the line explains uh, more and has, has more parsimony, you know, according to Occam's razor, and has more explanatory power in terms of understanding the mind's relation to matter. So, empiric, and the problem is, yeah, the, you're exactly right, yeah. Empirical evidence is a very limited form of um, uh, reason for believing in metaphysics. I mean, even, the thing is, a lot of, a lot of people who say that, if you really want, if you're really only going on empirical evidence, that will result in solipsism, the view that only you, only you as a mind exists, because you can't get empirical evidence that um, other people, let's say, are uh, visualizing a triangle. I mean, you can you can scan their brains and see correlates, but you can't actually see the triangle. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't believe that other people have minds or visual visual consciousness at all, and in which case you are left at solipsism. So yeah, exactly. So so not only are you using the wrong tool for the job, but that tool gets you somewhere you don't really want to be. But of course, you know, if you're in the if you're a scientist working only on empirical evidence, you don't look into epistemology, you know, theory of knowledge, you know, what do we accept for knowledge? So the problem is, I mean, when you explain this to a lot of people, they say, okay, yeah, fair enough, and they'll look into it. The problem is when you get dogmatic dogmatists who say, no, 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 that can't be right. I don't know why, but I'm sure it's wrong. And then they <laughs> then sort of betrays the faith position that they have. In. Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, another, another problem as well, I find, is that if you say you're not a physicalist or materialist, they, they, they think, therefore, you're a dualist. You know, as if there's only two options, and and so often I find myself having to say no. There are more than two options. Yes, yes, I I, I have found that as well. They think that you're you're taking a, a Cartesian position. And yeah. They go, oh well, that's you know interaction problem mm. that's been refuted, and then no, that there are I think fundamentally there's a, there's a wide range of, of yeah, and uh, fundamentally I think a lot of the current materialism stems from Cartesianism. You know, so because Car Descartes made the natural world dead. You know, inert spatial extension. That's true. You know, yeah. that's what they've inherited without realizing its, its historical legacy. So when you look at the history, it's really interesting. You look at the le le legacy from, uh, like I said, Galileo, Descartes, Hobbes, and so on, and then Locke and Hume, you realize that actually um, these were just assumptions made for methodological reasons. Um, but they would, you know, that you shouldn't take them for substantial truths. I mean, there's a big thing in the, you know, 100 years ago, called, uh, which retrospectively was named structural realism, which, like from people like Poincaré, the mathematician, which just said that science only gives you the sort of um, the structure of reality. It doesn't really tell you about the fundamental essence. So you can get the same differential equations to explain, um, let's say, light uh, uh, from different theories. So like um, 
you know, if you believed in ether, uh, you could explain light through a differential equation, which would be the same as if you didn't believe in ether to explain light like Maxwell did. But you realize that what remains the same as are the equations, but the reality could be radically different. In other words, ether or not ether. So it's, I, th I think Nietzsche said a lot, even in his day, you know, in the late 1800s, he said a lot of scientists don't have a historical, um, a historical taste or a historical aptitude. And I think a lot of these problems could be faced by looking at the history. Look at the history of materialism. A great book which Nietzsche um, used a lot was Friedrich Langer's History of Materialism. I mean, this is a great book even today. It goes through the thinkers. And when you trace it, I mean, he was, as a result, you know, he, he, was, he was not a materialist himself, but he showed, you know, that, that he traced the history of it. Fascinating. Very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But when you look at the history of something, um, you become less of a believer. Just like if you look at the history of Christianity and its morals, as Nietzsche did, you know, famously, especially in the genealogy, you know, you, it's sort of, um, in a way, it's called the genetic fallacy, but it certainly makes you um, question when you see yourself at the end of a historical path that could have gone very differently, then you sort of become very skeptical. Well, I do at least. I no, I, I I agree completely. So, let me. Do you think that psychedelics could have a potential for sort of ripping people away from their materialist leanings? Could that sort of provide them with empirical evidence, so to uh, so to speak? Uh, yeah. So, so I mean, it, I, yes, <laughs> I think so. I mean. Um, it, for me, at least, I mean, people's psychedelic experiences are quite radically different. But for me, at least, it's sort of, um, it was a bit like reading Nietzsche for the first time. Mm. It's, you, know, you read Nietzsche and sort of, you know, like rips you out of your society and your culture and your norms and your ideologies and gives you a really fresh look. Psychedelics also uh, did that in a different sense. They sort of, um, sort of rip your sense of yourself apart, for example, a very big philosophical issue. What is the self? Is it the body? Is it? memory, you know, so-and-so is your character. Um, like, it can, you know, I've had experiences where I've split into several selves. I've had experiences where I'm no self at all. Mm. Uh, you, 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 psychedelics um, allow for the um, isomorphism of subject and object, you know. Um, so it provides so much uh, actual empirical data, as it were, for questions in metaphysics and philosophy of mind and, and science generally, philosophy generally, that I think it's of it's invaluable, really. Yeah. Problem yeah. is, it's generally seen as recreational at the moment still and dangerous. And it is I it's know, dangerous in the sense that it's illegal. There are cases where people have psychological uh, uh, you know, ramifications, bad psychological ramifications for it, but they're very rare. But I, some people have approached me saying they've really they took LSD once and that sort of destroyed them mentally for 20 years. <laughs> But it's very, very rare. You know? I, I would really like to push for the legalization of psychedelics with at least, you know, having to get licensed for it or go through some sort of, you know, um, mental exam or something like that. What would you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm always pushing for the decriminalization of psychedelics. I mean, it's absurd that in theory, for example, in Britain, um, you could pick mushrooms in your garden and spend seven years in jail, in theory. Mm. You know, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, in practice, it doesn't happen, and the police don't really care about magic mushrooms or whatever. But in theory, the law is there, mm -hmm. and uh, someone could be made an example of. So absolutely that. I mean, it's by, the law in Britain and America and, and most countries, it seems, is based on bad science and uh, faulty logic. It's just it's absurd to have alcohol and cigarettes as legal uh, yet have magic mushrooms, for example, as illegal. It just doesn't make sense. They're just, you know, th there's a study from Imperial College in London which showed that, um, you know, the, it's sort of a bar chart of the harms of drugs and magic mushrooms were right at the bottom, virtually harmless, whereas, you know, alcohol is near the top, cigarettes somewhere, somewhere near the top as well, you know. This uh -huh. is a science. But, of course, politicians here, um, because people won't accept that science... Um, because of their preconceptions and because politicians don't want to lose their vote, you know, the status quo is, is maintained. So oh, this this will take, you know, decades, really. But there was an interesting case of um, um, cannabis being le legalized for medicinal purposes here, which was pretty quick, actually, last year. Mm. There was one particular case of a mother and a child, and the child really needed a, a form of cannabis for his um, ailments. And the government um, 
said it was legal, but there was so much media pressure uh, to say help this boy that they actually decriminalized it for, for medicinal use. So that's a good first step. And that was quick. So like yeah. I said before, things are changing quickly, but um, in Britain at least we have at the moment a conservative government who, uh, who are you know, very much against it. And, um, but one can live in hope. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, you know, on the topic of psychedelics, uh, Hyperionism is a mystery school, a modern day one. I was wondering if perhaps you touch on uh, the Eleusinian mysteries and their relation to psychedelics. Yeah, well, okay, so for those of you, for those listeners who don't know, viewers who don't know, the Eleusinian mysteries were sort of a formal religious event held in ancient Athens um, in Eleusis, which was about 14 miles away from Athens. Um, there were greater and lesser mysteries, but the greater ones, um, more interestingly, were kind of two-week affair. Anyone could go, a slave, master, um, and you know, except you had to speak Greek, and I think you weren't, and murderers were not allowed, but otherwise everyone was allowed. And um, ostensibly, the reason was to, um, of, to get rid of the fear of death. That was the main purpose of it. There were a lot, I should say as well, there were a lot of mystery festivals in ancient Greece at the time, Dionysian festivals, Nietzsche spoke about, for example. But the Eleusinian mysteries were the most in institutionalized, formalized version of it, with the huge temples and whatever, especially the Temple of Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. And that's who they were um, celebrating. But um, the interesting, for me, the interesting aspect of it is the, the sort of the... Uh, the apex of it was that initiates had to be taken into this uh, dark uh, building and therein um, they saw these incredible visions. And uh, like I said, it was supposed to get rid of their fear of death. Uh, now, the thing with the mystery, they're called the mysteries partly because you were not allowed to speak about them. You know, they were very secretive, even though everyone was allowed there, but you were not allowed to speak about them afterwards. So as a result, there's sort of, not that much literature about it. Uh, for example, Plato uh, writes about the mysteries to a certain extent, and um, he writes about, in the, uh, the Phaedrus especially, you know, sort of um, seeing uh, something like seeing the sublime light, uh, the gods and the goddesses being the train of Zeus, um, and so on, and, and, and getting ready for the afterlife. Now, traditionally, scholars have, have said there was some kind of theater play within this uh, building, um, you know, and that was the visions that Plato and others were speaking about. But I think that's highly unlikely, highly implausible. Um, you know, a theatre play wouldn't be a life-changing experience that everyone had to watch once a year. Um, and you wouldn't talk about actors and whatever as visions and, and sublime lights and whatever. And then you read that all initiates had to take a potion called the kaikion of a specific dose and they had to fast before that. Um, and before they went into this uh, temple, they had to take this potion. And uh, that potion consists of barley, uh, mint, and water. But, you see, the interesting thing is um, there were a lot of psychedelic-like brews in ancient Greece. Even wine was uh, hallucinatory. And that's why you had to water it down all the time. It wasn't wine as we understand it. Um, and um, Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, he uh, speculates that this potion, this kaikion, uh, contained uh, ergot because barley um, often is uh, this, this is a sort of a fungal parasite in barley called ergot, which LSD is derived from. And that was, he speculates, the sort of the active ingredient in this potion that they all took before they went into the temple. And this caused then the, uh, the visions, the psychedelic visions. So, you know, you can't prove this, but it seems more plausible than alternative views like theatre plays and whatever. Um, yeah, and comparing it, like I said, to ancient Greek culture of the time and the Dionysian festivals and the frenzies people got into and whatever, just seems more likely. And then, interestingly, you think, well, so Plato talked about these visions, and he Plato even wrote that he wanted to be considered as a mystic in this sense. And after talking about certain visions and and, uh, and talking about the fact that he wanted to be counted as a mystic in the Phaedo, the book on the soul, which is one of his most popular books in medieval times. Uh, he then writes, he then tries to rationalize dualism and the realm of forms, which exists outside of real, reality, as it were, actuality rather. So um, we see then, you know, you, it's a conjecture, and all history is conjecture ultimately. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's a, good, there's a good case to be made that psychedelics really 
um, influenced Plato, and of course Plato influenced Western philosophy. As Whitehead famously said, uh, all of uh, something like um, uh, Western philosophy is but a series of footnotes to Plato. You know, so maybe psychedelics lie at the heart of heart of philosophy, Western philosophy. Can't prove it, but it's an interesting story. No, that's fantastic. And I think it's very interesting how some of these greatest philosophers were either involved with psychedelics or the mystery traditions. Um, you know, even Hegel uh, being involved with hermeticism and whatnot. And, you know, I've had this experience on psychedelics where you can uh, have direct experience of the things that Hegel was talking about, you know, like the union of subject and object and being uh, one with the absolute and things like this. That's and, um, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry? No, I was just going to add that Spinoza as well. I mean, it's interesting that he uh, talks about three forms of knowledge, uh, mm. common, common understanding, uh, scientific knowledge, and then the third form he calls intuition. And the highest form of that is what he calls the intellectual love of God. By God, though, Spinoza means nature. Mm -hmm. His whole system was a monism that mind and matter and an infinite number of other attributes were all one thing, a monism. So there's an interesting case, there's an interesting um, uh, comparison that could be made between certain henological or unitive uh, psychedelic experiences and, and Spinozism, this, uh, this aspect of Spinozism. Actually, something I wrote about in an essay recently on uh, Humphrey Davy, Humphrey Davy, the great um, Cornish chemist, that he was also sort of, a, he was a natural philosopher, and he wrote a poem called Spino The Spinozist. It's just interesting to compare his incredible visions, Davy's, Davy's incredible visions with Spinoza's um, metaphysics. Um, so, yeah, that, that, uh, that's an essay I've recently wrote coming out soon, probably. But, okay. um, but uh, I, I want to write a separate essay soon just on Spinoza and psychedelics. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. Oh, I would thing. love to hear that, yes. I mean, you've heard the, you've heard the term cosmic consciousness, right? And Absolutely. It's kind of early 60s connotations, but it was actually, it was actually coined by R.M. Buck in 1901, I believe, right? And it's just a, a really interesting book by a psychologist, Buck. And it's about these unitive experiences in the great thinkers of the past. And mm -hmm. one of the chapters is on Spinoza and this, you know, I realized later. Um, so there's, so at the sort of heart of um, psychedelic parlance, cosmic consciousness, there is this immediate link to the great philosophers of the past, thinkers of the past, which again is lost, lost to history. Um, but uh, it will be revived. Absolutely. I, and so you consider yourself a monist? Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, as, as, my PhD is called Pan Sentient Monism. So, I mean, you know, a million qualifications to that word, so not in the sense that people might understand it, but basically, yeah. Similar to Spinoza, but I don't believe in Spinoza's um, differentiation of attributes such as extension and thought, because I think that's a, that's a legacy of Cartesianism. But, you know, along those lines, yeah, Whitehead, more clo closer to Whitehead. And Whitehead called himself a kind of neo spinozist as well. Oh, that's and and so you've also done a lot of work talking about Nietzsche and his use of drugs. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a there's a chapter in my book Numenautics called uh, Antichrist Psychonaut uh, about that. And um, that's a, that's a that's a great title, by the way. I, <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I was like pleased. that very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was pleased with that one as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, like Nietzsche took a hell of a lot of drugs. People, people don't really, you know, Nietzsche scholars don't talk about it much. Um, I think partly because there's a, there's a big uh, defensive mechanism to say that what Nietzsche wrote, especially at the end, uh, was clear and concise and what, he wasn't mad at that point at all. He only went mad in 1889, right? But that sort of then masks the fact that he, well, from a young age, he had had severe migraines, he had my, myopia and a bad vision, and um, he was taking painkillers for this, but he eventually became severely addicted, especially, uh, I mean, to opium. He took a lot of opium, and opium is known to be, um, you know, um, vision-inducing in large enough doses. I and mean, Thomas De Quincey wrote this great book called um, Confessions of an Opium Eater, where he talks about his amazing visions. So we know that opium is, can be hallucinatory like that. We, um, he was also addicted to chloral hydrate, um, he, which he mixed with uh, potassium nitrate and um, a number of hosts of other drugs. And there's even a report of one of his best friends, von Schoenhofer, 
who says that um, she came in to meet him in his house and he said that he saw these flowers circulating him, you know, so there's sort of second-hand um, trip report of Nietzsche's. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about, and then he talks about, you know, Dionysus at the beginning and at the end of his career. Mm -hmm. And Dionysus, of course, was the god of intoxication. Mm -hmm. um, and then he talks about, like, in Nikio Homo, his autobiography, he talks about, you know, being inspired, right? And he says, you know, but by inspiration, I'm, you have to go back 2,000 years to understand what I'm talking about. In other words, he hears voices, you know, he, he hears a kind of muse, uh, you know, who, who tells him um, what to think, what to write. I mean, again, conceivably drug-induced. And then, of course, in 1889, he, he did lose his mind. And uh, for 10 years, he was in a vegetative state where his mm -hmm. mother and sister looked after him. And uh, his sister actually uh, wrote about, his sister and mother believed that it was Nietzsche's drug use that made him mad. I mean, the common view is that it was syphilis or it was brain cancer. But um, I personally think it's a sort of combination of drugs and some other condition, uh, which was the sort of starter for, for those drugs. But we don't know what it is. I mean, Nietzsche's father died when he was a very young boy um, of a softening of the brain. So mm -hmm. it was something genetic. But anyway, yeah, no, he, he wrote... He, he wrote poems in the gay science about um, the poppy, you know, opium poppy. Mm. Uh, in his letters, he said he, took, he was taking huge doses of opium, which made him more rational. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting uh, comparison there yeah, between Nietzsche and, and psychedelics, or at least psychoactive drugs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a big correlation between philosophy and psychedelics. They both are liberating the mind just in a little bit of different ways. Um, absolutely. One thing, one thing I if noticed... You're doing philosophy of mind and you don't know really what the mind is capable of, you know, you're sort of, it's like you're doing music and you've only got access to flute and flute music, and that's it. You know? Yeah, so, it's, it's... Absolutely it's, necessary. And, and we really need to expand this community because, uh, like I said, I, I'm sort of uh, desperate for philosophy to be applied to the psychedelic experience because um you know just for example uh, certain experiences that that i have had of being in a state where it would seem as though you are getting a glimpse into what it may be like to have a different form of consciousness like for example you may be in a state where you're just seeing patterns and signals and you know perhaps this is what it's like to be an ant or a fly or something where yes, you, you're just seeing pleasurable signals and are and but that translates in the real world as, you know, going to um, f forage or avoid a predator or something. Yeah, no, interesting. I mean, um, there's a great white Hedian philosopher called Charles Hartshorn. Mm -hmm. He wrote he wrote about this thing called the prosaic fallacy, which is one of the reasons why people don't accept, for example, well, panpsychism, which is this, that most people think that consciousness is only what we understand it to be uh, in everyday life, prosaically, you know, normally, commonly. Um, and, and so to imagine what it is like to be, for example, a cell, I mean, is beyond our imagination. But yes, yeah, psychedelics provide then other forms of sentience, uh, which at least makes one more sympathetic to these other potential forms of being. So, Absolutely. yeah, although they don't intellectually um, deliver one to that position, they at least make, make people more sympathetic to the possibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people today still, still. Like, I know this guy who uh, designs brain scanners in, in Stockholm, and he, I mean, he thought he thinks, well, he thought. <laughs> I told him that um, psychedelic experience really is just sort of mixing concepts and percepts that you've had in everyday life. You know, so you oh, I've like, that so many times. No, yeah, but it's 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 not. It's novel. You know, so much of it is completely novel. It's not just also. It's not just visions. It's um, you know, inexplicable feelings or mental states which you can't even define as feelings you know so much beyond that that's why william james calls a lot of mystical states ineffable you know because they do not exist words which can convey what they mean not, and not, this, no yeah so and, so, well, so well, i mean like the very basic points of it have to be conveyed that no it's not just like a dream it's not it's 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 not imagination it's not uh, mixtures of these things it's something it's just other forms of experience and even the word experience maybe is too limiting. Other forms of existing. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think one of the reasons why it's so hard to put it into words is because words are static. Mm -hmm. And this experience is in motion. And it's alive. And it's pulsing. And you can't take something that's alive and pulsing and giving you this vivid experience and sort of take it and try and 
freeze it into static words. Yeah. No, absolutely. Alan Watts is great on that, actually. He's got some great analogies making the same point as you there, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's, there's another problem with materialism generally. It's, it's the problem of reification, you know, taking a concept and a word and then thinking that it denotes a natural kind, a real thing, you know, whereas actually um, it splits up nature artificially and then picks out sort of um, only parts of what's actually real. and But mm-hmm. then it picks out those parts and makes it into a sufficient concrete entity or thing, phenomenon. And, uh, and, that's, and then you compare it to other phenomena, and that's where they don't relate, and that's where you get into big problems. So, so absolutely, like an understanding that language is very limiting, although at the same time necessary for communication, most of communication. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of... Uh, it's it's a great good and great evil at the same time. But understanding the sort of pros and cons of language um, certainly will help you, I think, see a greater view of reality. And I think, again, that's what psychedelics can do. They certainly make you understand that, you know, they, they, they show you uh, the ineffability of, of what is what is real, because all and, experience is real. I see all of these artists who are, you know, artists are more familiar with drugs. Uh, and all these artists are taking the, you know, there's less of a taboo, that is. Yeah. And so they're, they're taking these drugs and they are creating these artistic pieces based on their experiences that are really pushing the boundaries of art. And they're coming out with, with new uh, types of visual mediums, etc., based on um, the psychedelic experience. And it's, it's expanding the art world. And that's what's so frustrating to me is I see that if... Uh, you know, academia would start to uh, explore this. It would push them as well to come up with new concepts, perhaps new forms of communication, just so many different new types of things that would, um, you know, expand the uh, realm of thought and conceptual ability. Well, yeah, absolutely. I discovered there's an in- interesting uh, uh, con- ramification of that is following. There was... Something I discovered after pneumonautics was a figure called John Smithies, right? Who's still alive. I think he's on his last, I've heard that he's in his, in his last stages now. He's 96, but he's a neurophilosopher. And um, I was, I've been in correspondence with him recently, email correspondence, and um, he's in San Diego, as I say. But um, he and Aldous Huxley and John Humphreys, who coined the term psychedelic, were working together in the 50s um, trying to get... Um, you know, about 100 of the world's leading intellectuals together or to take mescaline mm-hmm. and to write about it, right? Including Jung, Einstein, Graham Greene, Decas, H.H. H. Price, A.J. Uh, you know. Amazing. All this, yeah, and, and uh, they almost got the funding. You know, it's such a yeah. tragedy. They didn't get the money for that from the Ford Foundation. So oh. it didn't happen. But anyway, H.H. H. Price, uh, no, sorry, uh, John Smithies, he administered, he told me recently, he administered uh, mescaline to Aldous Huxley, which then, you know, triggered the, uh, the Doors of Perception, the famous book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and um, he's mentioned in that book at the start. Um, but he also, he told me, and I didn't know this before, he, he gave it to H. H., the philosopher H.H. H. Price, who wrote a really interesting essay on mescaline. Um, he was an Oxford philosopher. But most interestingly, and this is, I didn't know this before, and I've done a lot of research here, he told me that he administered mescaline to C.D. Broad, philosopher C.D. Broad, Oxford philosopher. Hmm. That's really interesting because C.D. Broad was very, very influential in philosophy of mind. He's got this great book from 1925, I think, called uh, The Mind and Its Place in Nature. And, and then and a lot of subsequent, subsequent work on the mind. But that he took mescaline, so it, was very, it was very revealing. And, you know, C.D. Broad was always very open-minded. And uh, at the same time, very analytic, very detailed in his logic of mentality. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that there could be a possible influence there from mescaline. I don't know if there is, but, you know, something I now have to look into properly. I only found this out, you know, a few months ago. Wow, that's, um, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. fascinating. But John yeah. Smith himself, he's got these bizarre, theory, in, very interesting theories about hyperspace, about space having more than three dimensions. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. Um, right. And uh, one wonders whether that's somewhat influenced by his mescaline intake. You know, I'm trying to tease that out of him um but he's like published in neuroscience and so on so he's a bit you know i think he's a bit um he doesn't want to be sort of associated with hippies and and so on but nonetheless his if you i've got a 
It's online on Academia, a sort of conspectus, a summary of his views on n-dimensional space and the mind. Fascinating stuff. You know, he thinks that we can only really understand the relationship between matter and mind by incorporating more than three spatial dimensions. Not time, but, you know, like um, more more than three uh, dimensions of space. So like, well, next one, more than left, right, up, down, forward, backward, but also the fourth one and, and so on. And it's really interesting. It's really, you know, it's a good argument, really. You know, and it makes me think of, you know, in physics, um, um, Einstein couldn't really uh, relate his theories of gravity to uh, electromagnetism. And then uh, that, a mathematician called Kaluza came, came along and wrote, wrote to Einstein and said, listen, if you, if you postulate a fourth spatial dimension, I think it was in 1919, if you, if you postulate a fourth spatial dimension, then... Uh, the law, your laws of gravity and the laws of electromagnetism uh, cohere and become one grand theory. And Einstein, uh, you know, was shocked by this and pu- publicized it, you know, two years after getting it, you know. And then, of course, later on, you know, we have, like, you know, um, string theory, all these different, you know, brain theories and whatever, which postulate more than three dimensions of space. So physics is doing it, and that's sort of what makes them not materialists in a way, depending on your definition of materialism. But, you know, philosophy hasn't really got to that stage yet, postulating more than three dimensions of space. Well, this, um, yeah, th- this, is, this is really fascinating to me because uh, the system that I work under um, actually postulates six dimensions. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, so it's very interesting. Now, um, I am absolutely loving talking with you, but we're coming up on an hour, and yeah. uh, I don't want to test the attention spans of the viewers here, but um, before we go, I just wanted to ask you uh, one last thing is that, um, so in our system, the universe is essentially a living mental organism that's mathematically optimizing itself and striving for greater and greater symmetry, um, in essence, greater and greater power. It's optimizing to constantly strive to increase its power. So I was wondering what you would think about the idea of the universe as an organism striving to reach uh, maximal power. Mm. Well, that's, that's that's a very big question. Um, I mean, immediately I think of Plato's world soul. So again, all footnotes to Plato, right? Indeed, yeah. Uh, but uh, also reminds me of Have you heard of Gustav Fechner? Um, he was a uh, founder of psychophysics and uh, and a founder of panpsychism. But he his his panpsychism became cosmopsychism, right? So, you know, it wasn't just that atoms, molecules, cells, organisms had sentience, but he went beyond that. Planets had sentience, stars had sentience, and ultimately the universe was, you know, huge sentience, like much like the Gaia theory later. But he, he was there first. Um, number one, whether I, whether I accept that, I would, I'd say this, I'd like to accept it because it seems very nice and parsimonious. But I haven't really got to that stage yet where I, I've looked into it enough to say one way or the other. I'm open-minded to it. That's like, fantastic. I, all, all, also, I mean, like, you know, the whole thing, of, you know, being a, once being at least a hardcore Nietzschean and the whole God is dead thing, you know, to sort of, sort of say the universe is living is kind of like saying there's a God, so I'm kind of averse to that. But well, it's, it's sort of in a Spinozian sort of way. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And, in that nature is alive uh, as a, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know I'm sympathetic to it, but I'm, I'm not going to commit myself one way or the other. I'm open-minded to the idea, whether it's striving for power. I mean, Whitehead talks about God and uh, in two aspects, you know, primordial nature, which contains basically the forms, Plato's forms, the eternal objects, but also the consequent nature of God is that God is constantly striving to feel aesthetic satisfaction in his creatures. And the more complex they become, the greater the set, the level of satisfaction. So in that sense, I suppose he's striving for at least power in terms of complexity, experiential complexity. Mm-hmm. And uh, but, but Whitehead himself says this is now very speculative and so on and so forth. But yeah, you know, I'm open. I'm certainly open to the idea, but I haven't that's, really. I haven't yeah, got to that's, that. That's fantastic, and that's what I like about you and your work so much is that you are a free thinker in a world of closed-minded individuals even in even among philosophers there are they're so hard to find these these days um so that's that's why i really enjoy you and your work um and uh, yeah so and for those listening you really need to check out neo-nihilism and pneumonautics 
Um, yeah, yeah. I can't say. Got a new coming out soon as well, a new collection of essays, including that Davy one with Spinoza and uh, a number of other juicy bits. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. And to look out also for your TED Talk, fingers crossed that it's not banned. It yeah. should be out soon, yes? Uh, it should be, and I think it will be. But uh, who knows? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. Ultimately, I don't know anything at all. That's excellent. And if you're up for it, I would love to talk with you again in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, right, well, pleasure. Thank you for your time. Really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, yeah. me as well. I've, I did as well. I've, I've looked into your work, uh, you know, since you got in touch, and it looks really interesting and great style. So, um, yeah, now I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. All right. Well, thank you so very much, and I'll talk with you soon. Ad Astra. Oh.